I rediscovered fighting games as a teenager because a friend of mine took me to an arcade and I was just like, oh sweet, I'm addicted, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna start doing this because there's the, the rush of just having people watch you while you play something was, was, was completely new to me, right? And all it took was 50 cents in a pizza place in Berkeley. Um, but I think that like, that is, you know, that might explain um, kind of the, the 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 diversity in the scene when Street Fighter II first launched. But Street Fighter II captured the country's attention, right? I think it was the most successful game of its time, at that, you know, around then. Um, and so, you know, when when we ask like, why is the fighting game community still diverse, right? And back and, and when when Street Fighter II launched, it wasn't a community; it was just a bunch of people playing the game, right? Um, my favorite, I, I think, the the explanation that I can I I, I think is the most accurate is. Um, it was, there are largely people of color playing fighting games, um, at least to, to a, a, a degree that we don't normally see um, in kind of other video game communities. Um, I think it's because people of color made the fighting game community, right? Uh, the Cannon Brothers, they're the, the, the two, um, they're the twins actually, that uh, organized some of the first major tournaments in California and in the United States, right? Um, they uh, founded Shoryuken.com, which is the, the you know, one, kind of one of the fighting game community nexuses. It was, it was a, for a long time, it was kind of the, the center of the fighting game community. Um, and they, they launched EVO, and the tournament series started as like the B series, which then turned into Evolution, right? Which is the, basically the world championships for, for fighting games. Um, they're both black. And so I think that it says something when major kind of community institutions in your, you know, in, in, in this particular subset of gaming um, are kind of owned, operated, and run by people of color that it make that, you know, the, the, the barriers to entry that you might see elsewhere in the industry aren't necessarily there, right? Um, so yeah, like in, in my mind, really what it was was uh, people of color kind of came together to architect a lot of the institutions that the fighting game community now rely on, right? And this is happening in a space where, you know, Capcom and the other developers and publishers kind of didn't pay a whole lot of attention to for a long time. Um, Capcom is very recent in its, in its kind of, you know, in its dedicated support for the, for the Street Fighter community, for example. Um, in the early years of Evolution, it would be like, you know, maybe they'll bring a, a new build of a game to try out, or maybe they'll, you know, they'll kind of like, they'll, they'll just let it happen, right? They won't interfere. Um, but uh, for a long time, it, the fighting game community was just us trying to put together, you know, a competitive scene, trying to learn how to set up streams. And I mean, before we could do live video streaming, we had DVDs of tournament footage that Evo would publish every year and sell for like 30 or 40 bucks or something, right? Um, we really did build this. Um, and so I think that, re like, that just made it much easier to create an inclusive atmosphere and an inclusive community in that respect, right? Um, and personally, I love it. Like, I love that, um, you know, you kind of, you, you alluded to class and ethnicity as the, the kind of the defining markers of the fighting game community's diversity. I, like, there is, it's, it's really nice that if I walk into a fighting game community event dressed like this, people will look at me funny, right? Because I'm way overdressed to go to a tournament.